<laughs> Just use this for the outtake. Just me wrestling, trying to get my hair. <laughs> All right. So I'm, I'm pressing on live now. All right. Hello, and welcome to Jason Cavendish Experience. I'm your host, Jason Cavendish. Our guest today is Mary Rossi. Mary, are you ready to be great today? I'm ready. Mary has served as an active duty military spouse for the last 10 years and currently serves as a reserve spouse. During this time, she has learned a great deal about taking a challenge and turning it into a benefit. With each deployment, TDY, and training, she used the extra time to learn more, work harder, and expand your skill set. With over 11 years in design and strategy, Mary has a proven track record of helping brands grow. After launching Ember Creative at the beginning of 2018, she is now looking to grow and expand Ember's reach. It is her mission to both to other creatives around her to dream bigger and work more on the products they love. Mary, thank you for being here today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. I'm excited to be here and talk about brand and military and all the things. So Mary, you have a lot going on. We'll talk about each one in more detail, but what, what are you focused on right now? Um, well, my interests are somewhat split um, with COVID and everything that had started uh, working from home with Ember the last couple of years. I started getting my MBA, so I'm in grad school right now. Um, I have a skincare company I'm a part owner in. I have a few cannabis brands that we're part owner in. Uh, working with Ember Creative. So it's a lot of different things of, you know, on top of being a full-time mom and taking care of the house while my husband works out of the home as an essential worker right now. So what is, what is creative? Like, what does that even mean? Like you hear that word toss around, oh, I'm a creative. I, I create stuff. What, I mean, what does that even mean? Yeah. And you hit the nail on the head. There are so many different meanings of it. Even when you get into the profession of design today, there are so many different versions of design and specialties in design, and especially with the abundance of the internet, that job description has changed. And a creative is just somebody who creates, who makes things. So this could be in design, this could be illustrations, this could be development. There are creative developers out there, um, video, motion graphics, photography, you name it, it goes under the umbrella of creative. Um, so it can mean a lot of different things to a lot of different industries. And that's one of the reasons why my title at Ember Creative is founder slash creative, because it depends on the client. It depends on the project, what I do, what type of work we do, what type of creative I need to be. So does a person get to say I'm a creative or does someone else say, no, you're the creative? Like who gives the person a title? If that makes any sense. That's a great question. I've never actually thought about it a lot before. I would think that anybody who is making things and creating things could self-proclaim that they're a creative. Um, it's not really a job title specifically, so you couldn't really go into an office and say, I'm a creative, because you have to narrow down what you're trying to accomplish, what you're trying to achieve. So it's more of just a descriptor of a type of person versus you know, a job title that you would need for anything. So like, I don't like to talk about generalities a lot, but usually when you think about creative, you think about, you know, creative, but they're kind of, you know, lack of a better word, scatterbrained, not real organized, you know. One thing I really like about Mary, she's like, has, she's the best of both worlds, right? Very organized, very detailed, and still creative, right? But most creatives, like, they're all the place, right? Is that just a, like a genetic trait most creatives have, or why is that you think? Well, for me specifically, I always describe myself as creative chaos. Um, or sorry, organized chaos. <laughs> so you have the organization part and you have the creativity part. For design specifically, you need to think about so many other things than just the creative part. So there are a lot of artists and especially artists get, you know, kind of the bad rap of being very scattered, but there are a lot of organized creatives out there. And one of the things that I've always loved about design is that there's three parts to the job. The first one is that you have the creative element that you need to be able to make beautiful things. The second thing is you have to be able to research and understand the goals of that company, build that strategy and the concept behind a design to make it meaningful. And then you have to be able to sell it. You have to be able to tell the story behind the concept, why you made what you did and why it's important and how it's going to communicate to the audience. So for me, I really liked that design gave me all of those things. And that I could use both sides of my brain and, you know, have that research side and the organization side and it all kind of comes together. With designers also, there's a certain level of kind of OCD that plays into the job profession just in general. 
um, when you're looking at a design, whether it's web or for print, you're looking at pixels. You are looking at moving images so that everything lines up in a grid, no matter how long that web page is. So being able to do that, you have to have some sort of, you know, organization so type A personality. How do you stop from being like too perfect, so to speak, right? How you know, like, this is good enough. I think probably a lot of creators are probably have a problem, like, you know, being like, this is not perfect enough, right? How do you, how do you solve that? Mm -hmm. For me, it was never about trying to be perfect. It's about trying to find the right solution for a client, what they're trying to do, what they're trying to communicate, again, what their business goals are. Um, design with a lot of these other companies that have come along, like the Fivers and the 99 Designs and the Upworks, it's really turning design work into a commodity. Um, it's something that can be bought and sold. You can kind of price compare on things. But when you have to have that strategy side of it or it's not going to be meaningful. So you really have to have a little bit of everything in it. When did you realize that you were creative? That just one day you just popped up, oh, I'm a creative, or was it a process, or how did you learn this? Well, I always wanted to draw horses as well as my sister did. When I was younger, I have a sister that's three years older than me, and she was always drawing, and I always wanted to be like her, so I was always drawing too, um, trying to get better, trying to get as good as her. I fell in love with the Garfield comics, and so then I started um, redrawing those comics, uh, making my own, coloring them in, you know, coloring books, all of those things. I just was fascinated about the color and the layout of everything and just using my hands and I practiced it a lot. And I started to realize that maybe I was good at it when I got called out for tracing something when I was in middle school. And the teacher, you know, they brought my mom in, they thought I had traced something. And I, at that moment realized, oh, if they think I traced it, I did it so good that they think I traced it because I knew I hadn't. <laughs> And it was just the moment where I realized, well, maybe I'm good at this and I enjoy it. So maybe I should figure out a way to make it my profession. You, you were in middle school when that happened? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I believe it was seventh grade. Yeah, that's pretty good, though. You know, so young, yeah. what you wanted to do. Yeah, so, but I had a lot of practice at that point. Yeah. So first in design, I think a lot of people think design is like, you know, website design. Mm -hmm. But design is everything. Like the water bottle right there. Somebody designed that water bottle, right? Mm -hmm. And I think a lot of small business owners, entrepreneurs, they don't think about design enough, right? Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, like we were talking about before, you have UI designers, UX designers, you know, this water bottle would be an industrial designer. You have product designers now. Um, everything is design. I mean, there's companies that figure out the design of processes for, you know, things like Boeing. So those, the management and the creation of certain products, those are designers too. So design is a really wide term that pretty much just encapsulates we're going to create something for a certain audience and we have to figure out how that is going to be best interpreted by them, best used by them, how we can make their lives easier, how we can make this process easier. And for design and what I do, that just happens to also be visual. And there's so, I think there's three parts, like there's graphic design, user design, and something else, right? Yeah, user experience, user, user experience. interface, and then graphic design are the three things that most people know about and understand unless they work in the industry or they have a tech startup. Um, they're probably very familiar with product designers. And so like if you're a brand new designer, I think there's like two options. One, that go to Microsoft and like do one little bitty thing over and over again, right? And be narrow focused or go to a brand new company to start like do everything right. What's your recommendation for people starting out? Or Yeah. And that's a great question. So for designers, when they are finishing school and they're figuring out what they want to do, I always say that there's three versions of that. So you mentioned the first two, you can work for a large corporation where you know they need a lot of designers, they're doing a lot of marketing, they need to produce a lot of things. It's a great place for students to go and understand the process of it and get more experience. Um, and some designers love it. It's a very specific type of you know, environment. And so you have to think about your personality and what you want your career to be and what you get excited about. The second option is to work at an agency, like you were mentioning, where it's going to be a little bit of a quicker pace in some ways. You're going to be working on different projects all the time, so it's fun to be able to work on different things. Um, you can go freelance, which you'll have some similar things as an agency where you're working on different projects. You're you know, stretching your mind in ways that you might not be at some other companies. Or you can also go to a startup. 
Um, you know, we talk to a lot of business owners. We talk a lot about business owners and entrepreneurship, especially in the veteran residence program that we're in. Um, and that is a whole different thing too. You're working on one project, but in a lot of ways, it's starting it from scratch. So you're building that brand from nothing. You're figuring out what makes sense to execute on, whether it's social media ads, if that makes sense for the company, or maybe it's a targeted website or different landing pages, or maybe it is a print ad. <laughs> I'm just gonna keep hitting the mic. <laughs> I talk a lot with my hands. <laughs> um, but they're all different environments. So it takes a certain level of self-awareness to understand what makes you happy as a designer, where you want your career to go, what what are your goals? You know, we talk about one year goals, five year goals, 20 year goals, and you might not have all of those, but you should at least know yourself enough to have an idea of where you would thrive or what you're trying to get better at. A lot of people, you know, will do the things that they're good at because it feels good to be good at what you're good at. But if you're not as good at something, you need to practice that thing even more. So sometimes taking on opportunities where you can have that growth and you can focus on things that maybe you're not the best at yet and, you know, pick from there. So as a designer, should your mentality be, I'm going to go get a job and do all three? Or should you tell me, you know what, I'm going to I should get paid for three jobs, right? I should get paid all three things. After the designers tell me, no, I need to get paid, you know, a designer, blah, blah, blah. Or should you just be like one mm -hmm. price, so to speak? It's a big consideration, especially right now. Um, you know, school debt is really high. But there are a lot of certification programs you can do for design. There's a lot of different online resources that if you want to be a designer, you can do it for free. You have to put in a lot of legwork. You have to do a lot of self-education. You have to know what you're looking for and what you want to do. But, you know, like the Adobe Live with Behance TV, um, that's a great way to learn design without going to school. If you go to school and you have those, you know, deferred payments that you have to start making payments on, if you get a four-year degree or you go to, you know, grad school or undergraduate school to get your bachelor degree, you have to be able to pay that off. So a paid job is going to be very important. One of the things that I typically recommend to design students is that you get an internship as soon as humanly possible, because if you have deferred payments while you're in college, it'll be a big workload. Um, but you'll get experience. So then that way, when you get out of college, you can go directly into a firm and say, I have two years of experience or I have a year of experience. People are going to look at your portfolio, but they're also going to want to know if you've been working with clients directly. So you can do freelance projects on the side while you're in college, or you can do internships to gain that experience. Can you talk about the points of uh, designers having portfolios? The points with designers and portfolios. Can yeah. you repeat that? Sorry, my yeah. headphones aren't on at all. Okay. Can, can you, I just take them yeah, off? Yeah, okay. <laughs> can you talk about the points of designers having portfolios? Yeah. Um, so for a lot of professions, it's going to be more about, you know, where you went to school or the network, you know, and those things can still be important, but for design specifically, it's more about your portfolio and your ability to articulate your thinking and your process through those things. One, because you need to know if you get a difficult client or you get a difficult project, if you get stuck in some way, especially if you're freelancing, you need to know how to get yourself unstuck. Uh, working in design and the creative process, everybody's gonna have a little bit of a different of a process. And if you can articulate the steps that you take to build a great design and what you take into consideration, when you're interviewing for a job, that company will know if you're gonna be a good fit for them process-wise, and you'll know what questions to ask to see if they're a good fit for you as well. But everybody's gonna have that different process. Um, it needs to look aesthetically good. Like I was mentioning before um, with design becoming more of this commodity, anyone can go on Pinterest or Dribbble or all of these other inspiration sites, look at beautiful de design and be able to recreate it. The difficult part and the part that's gonna become, you know, even more important as designers are learning and if they wanna progress in this career path is to understand strategic thinking because you have to understand what that company's business goals are. You have to understand the target audience that they're, you know, they're trying to talk to or who is that appropriate target audience. Um, UX and UI designers a lot of times will come up with personas for those target audience members so they know who they're speaking to so they can design appropriately. Um, so one part of it is it has to look beautiful, 
But the other part of the portfolio is it has to be effective or you have to be able to talk about what challenge it solves for a business owner. And that's, that'll be the make or break or just make a big difference in what types of jobs you can get. So when you personally bring on a designer, what characteristics are you looking for? What are you looking for? Or maybe a better question, what are you not looking for when you bring on a designer? <laughs> yeah. Um, one of the first things that I personally look for is passion. Um, anytime you're interviewing somebody, I mean, we as humans just naturally try to look for traits that we have that we want to see in other people. Um, but for me, passion is really important because it speaks to the intrinsic motivation that they have beyond just, you know, coaching or mentorship or other things that they get out of their job. If they already have a passion for creating things or doing design, it just makes it so much easier to just dive into a project and get excited about it. And I still get excited about design. I mean, I've been doing this for a very long time. And every time I get a new project, I get excited. So passion is important for me. Um, in that way, I want somebody who's very candid and open to taking candid feedback. As designers, um, you know, it's very subjective what we do. There are plenty of other professions where you kind of know A plus B equals C. There is a process there. There is a measure of success. For design, you know, you put those measures of success in place and you talk about those to set expectations, but you have to know where you're going. But at the end of the day, you might have a client that says, oh, I don't like that color because I don't like that color. And if they're not the target audience, you have to deal with those subjectivity, you know, being put on the design and how to handle a lot of that um, outside of just making it pretty. So being able to have candid conversations and ask more questions if somebody's giving you feedback um, and not get shut down. Because if designers get shut down, it's very hard to make creative things. It's hard to be creative when you're not inspired or is yeah. that something you have to train designers to be able to do? Like, you have kind of feedback. You know, a lot of people know that's my boss, my supervisor, with the project lead. Mm -hmm. I probably don't need to say this, but how do you train them to, you know, do that? It can be a very difficult thing. And the profession is evolving. When I went to school and a lot of designers that I knew before me, it wasn't the easiest profession to get into. And not many people knew about it. Even I'm originally from Wyoming, a large town in Wyoming. And you know, a lot of people didn't understand what I wanted to do. You know, even family members, I was all four years through school. And one of the best ways that I describe it was taking somebody into a supermarket and saying, you know, see that packaging, see that signage, see these floor graphics. Somebody like me got paid to do that. That's what designers do. And it clicked a little bit more. Um, but now with the internet certificate programs, all of these opportunities where you can be a self-taught designer, more people are getting into it because you can make good money at it and less because it was passion when it was just an art profession you know there was the starving artist you know commentary that most people and that was one of my reasons for getting into design is because i wanted to do art forever i just didn't want to be a starving artist so it worked out and i'm so glad i did because i love it more than i even thought i could um but it's easy to get into so you don't see as much passion in in some people as you do others. And I mean, it's kind of something you have to build within yourself. You can get people excited about it, but it's hard if you get into a job role and you're not already excited or at least excited to learn more and to try. And I think that's kind of the difference there. So Mary, you know, with COVID-19, uh, remote work's a you know, big thing. Mm -hmm. and, and of course they seem like designers were then aside from remote work. But is remote work, remote work really the best way to do design? It depends on the ability to communicate from the designer. Just like with any, you know, culture or business culture that you have, you have to make sure that you can communicate properly. So the remote work just puts more barriers in place and it makes it more challenging to communicate. If you put a focus on that communication and you look for ways that you can share designs and articulate what you're thinking and think ahead. So if you know you're going to have questions or you know that you're missing some information to do your job properly, being able to communicate is huge, just like when you're in office, but remote even more. So it's not necessarily that it makes it harder. You just have to adapt to be able to do it well. And it also depends on your personality type. Um, for me, I am, I am about as extroverted as you can get. I think on a Myers-Briggs, I was 90% extroverted. Um, and all the personality tests. So I do thrive being around people. 
And it can be a challenge when you are making designs and you get stuck on something and you have nobody to talk to about it. And that's when that community comes in. You should be networking, you should be meeting people, you should be building that community around you, whether it's personal, work, you should have people that you can you know, bounce ideas off of or ask for an honest opinion about it. And that could be another designer that you respect very much. You could find a mentor and ask for feedback in that way. But building that community is important and being able to communicate is even more. So I think Malcolm Gladwell, I think I say his name right, had the you know, 10,000 hour rule. You got to do some of the 10,000 hours to be an expert, so to speak. Mm-hmm. Is, is that the same design, you think? The same, same rule applies? I mean, anything that you become an expert at, like you were mentioning, um, and I love Malcolm Gladwell and, you know, the theories behind outliers. And, you know, some people are going to be born with just a natural ability or more of just a natural interest in it. And that's how you get to that 10,000 hours. So that's one of the reasons um, they talk about why colleges are four-year programs. Because if you do that full-time for about four years, you hit around that 10,000 hour mark. Um, You might have to fact check me on that (laughs) because it's something, you know, that I probably read a really long time ago and who knows, research could have come out and it could be completely wrong at this Uh, point. I'll I'll check Facebook. (laughs) Okay. (laughs) Um, Make sure you check Twitter too. Um, But when you're looking at those things, you know, if there's, you know, say a child and they love drawing and like I did, I spent all of my spare time drawing, coloring and creating these things. I naturally just ended up having that 10,000 hours younger than some other people because I was always doing it. Um, so practice, the more you practice, the more you're working on stuff, of course, the better you're going to get. Um, ideally you get to you know, that 10,000 hour mark or just an expert level mark. There's also a lot of research studies that show um, it's not as much about the practice that you put in, but making sure that you're having that feedback loop with yourself. So experimenting with something, getting those metrics, seeing if it's beneficial, seeing if you're learning that thing, and then adjust the way that you're learning it, if not. So that continued you know, criticalness of yourself, of what you can do better, how you can adjust so that you can be better, whether it's at your job or in your personal life, has been found to be even more effective than just the 10,000 hour hard and fast rule. So you talked earlier about designers being able to that, know that the, the business part, the strategic level. Mm-hmm. And I could be wrong because like a lot of designers, they design, design, they network with other designers. How you, how do you get designers like, no, get off, get out of your comfort zone, go like networking meetings. Like, like I tell people like, don't go to like a networking event with other designers, go to networking with but don't business people. How do you convince them to mm-hmm. get out of the comfort zone and go meet with business people? Well, it, again, it just kind of depends on everybody. Um, I know for myself, the more comfortable I am is usually because of the research or the knowledge I have behind that subject. So I've noticed if I'm fearful something, if I'm hesitant of something, it's because I don't feel like I have all the information I need to make a decision or have a conversation or things like that. It's actually one of the reasons why I'm getting my MBA right now. Because I work with so many small business owners and large business owners, I need to understand what their challenges are. I need to understand how they approach their business and what's important to them so that I can be more effective for them through design. So it's kind of the same way when you're at a networking event. If you want to go into those networking events, but you're not sure what to talk about or who to talk to, start reading articles. Look at current research studies that are happening in the business realm. You know, find some conversation starter to have with people, whether it's you know, hey, tell me about your, tell me about your brand. Oh, have you ever considered, you know, design, design, design perspective? So you can bring new things to the table, no matter how old you are, no matter how much education you have in something. Every human is different and we've all had different life experiences. So you have something to bring to the table, even if you're not as educated as maybe somebody else. You're more educated in design than that business owner probably is. So you can still give advice based on the things that you've learned. So make it a two-way street in a conversation. Yes, you have to have overlap to begin facilitating that conversation. If anything, just practice open-ended questioning. You know, find some articles about asking open-ended questions, you know, proper ways to have communication, you know, conversations of repeating what somebody said, maybe adding an antidote or, you know, adding some advice and then asking them another question to continue that conversation in a meaningful way. So Mary, to follow up your MBA, like if we talk about this for our pre-talk, you know, a lot of people say if you're an entrepreneur, 
don't get an MBA to waste your time. But you decided mm-hmm. to get an MBA. Can you explain in more detail why you're here? I mean, you have all this stuff going on. <laughs> you know, you're, you're a full-time parent, military spouse, several mm-hmm. companies you're dealing with, you know, and then to take on an extra, I don't want to say burden, but extra time suck mm-hmm. of MBA, right? Yeah. Why, why do that to yourself? What's the value you're getting out of this? <laughs> well, I love learning. And I am way too type A to be a heavily self-taught learner. Some things I will teach myself. Um, but for me, I am a perfectionist and I'm very type A, like you've already mentioned. And I want to make sure that I'm getting the best information I can from sources that are already credible. So if there's an expert in the source, I would rather hear their information than trying to figure it out on my own. Um, that's just a personality trait of me. Not everybody is like that. Some people enjoy, you know, the process of self-learning. I've been wanting to get an MBA for a while. Um, My father always taught us that no education is bad education and that you always learn something from every experience that you have, which I completely agree with. So when I was looking at MBA options, obviously the first one I was looking at was going into marketing. Um, So doing a master's degree in marketing, doing the MBA, so getting a business degree, or looking into maybe social psychology, organizational psychology, So much of design is rooted in the psychology of humans and the way we interact with one another. And I thought that might be beneficial too. At the end of the day, like I was mentioning before, I work with a lot of business owners and to be able to understand them better, I decided ultimately the MBA program was what I wanted to do. I'm doing it fully online. So that really gives me the flexibility. I'm in school full time. So I'm taking two classes at a time um, each quarter. But because it's online, I can do it late at night. I can do it early in the morning. I can do reading in my spare time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, quote unquote spare time. Yeah. Um, so I just wanted to be a better asset for my clients. And next, talk about your role, which is I think it's called Zoo Labs. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so I also um, help do educational workshops. Um, one of the things I love outside of designing is teaching. And whether it's teaching business owners about brands and how they can, you know, start thinking about their brand and how to be successful through brand. Um, I've, I was teaching at SVC prior for their uh, UI program. They have a certificate program there. And I also work with Zoo Labs. So Zoo Labs is a nonprofit that helps musicians um, think through all the business stuff that comes with music, like any art profession. Back to the starving artist. Thing. Yeah, back to the starving artist thing. Um, the more that we can teach creatives about business and about brand and about marketing themselves, the better. Um, so together with Erin Austin, uh, she has a few musical projects, but one of her main one is OK Sweetheart. And so together, the two of us developed a workshop for Zoo Labs that teaches uh, brand for musicians. So teaching them to think about, you know, what do they want their persona to be? Where are their fans at and how can they market to them? Is this nationwide, I'm guessing? Um, They're housed out of Oakland. Okay. So they're locally there in Oakland. Um, Sometimes Aaron will be on site to teach some of the workshops and then I usually am virtual. And so we'll kind of co-teach it. And when you say musicians, do you mean like, like, uh, like all kinds of musicians, like classical musicians, rock musicians, or just musicians in general? Mm -hmm. It's a program that you have to apply to. Um, And then there's a board of people that look at these different musicians and say, yes, they're ready to, you know, make the next big jump in their career. And so what's great about Zoo Labs too, is they have recording studios, they have a kitchen, you can stay there, you can record your music, and then you learn all this stuff about business as well. Um, But yeah, any type of music. Okay. Let's talk about your your skincare company, uh, Bambina. Bambini Skin. skin. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So... When I became part of that project, it, it's a funny story because I met Andrea through buying our house. She was our real estate agent, um, but she would always make these beautiful natural skincare products and she would either leave them you know, in the home. She would make a beautiful soy candle and leave it in the home of the new house that you know, the homeowners were moving into that she helped them find or she was making really beautiful skin oils. Her, she has multiple kids and they all have different skin issues and she has really dry skin. So figuring out something that would work for her. So just out of love of what she wanted to do, she started making these skincare products. Um, we became friends after she sold us our house and we continually talked and she was always telling me about the skincare company she wanted to launch. So she saved up her money and she hired me as Ember Creative to do a, 
you know, a renaming process. We did a logo brand identity for it. We did all the packaging. And when she ran out of money, she knew that, you know, she loved working with me and I had been using her products and, you know, I have a seven and a half year old son and I had struggled with dry skin issues since the day that he was born. And her products were the first thing that I put on my face that I don't have dry skin issues anymore. And it's all natural. So it's nothing that's going to be harsh chemical based stuff. I have really sensitive skin, so it never worked for me. Um, so she had approached me with the offer to become part of the company and take on the marketing and the design and all of that stuff that was definitely needed for her. Um, and I believed in what she was making so much that I said, yes. So you're like kind of like a founder of the company now. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So I'm a part owner in the company and I take on the creative side and she takes the creative side of building amazing products. And I guess the vision that I can become a national skincare brand. Mm. We'll see. <laughs> and then your main focus among other folks is, 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 your, is your company Ember Creative, correct? Mm -hmm. Yep. That's my main focus. And that started in 2018. Mm -hmm. And so how did that, how did that come about? So it was always a dream of mine to, well, I guess to tell this story, I have to back up a step. Um, like I told you, when I was a child and I was drawing and doing all the creative stuff, I knew that I wanted to get a degree in art. Um, so when I was in high school and I was 18 in my senior year of college, I was enrolled at the Kansas City Art Institute. I had a partial scholarship. I had a roommate already assigned. Um, and at the last minute, I decided to pull out and not go to art school. Um, I did this because I was 18 and I was in love. And so I decided to get a massage therapy degree instead so that I could stay in Wyoming and work as a massage therapist. <laughs> Smart move. <laughs> yeah. Um, so, I mean, I learned a ton about myself. I loved learning the holistic side of healing and health, which probably, you know, made for my love of the Bombini skin products and what Andrea was creating. Um, but after that point, I realized that I wasn't doing what I was supposed to be doing. And then I, you know, like all good decisions are made. I did a Google search for art Mecca of the nation, San Francisco came up. And then I did a Google search for art schools in San Francisco and then Academy of art came up and I applied there. And then I moved there and restarted going back to school. Um, and I tell you that because it really fed into the drive and the passion that I have for it now. And because of that experience, I not only wanted to become a designer, I wanted to own my own agency. I wanted to be the best designer I possibly could be. I wanted to learn illustration. I wanted to learn just traditional design. I wanted to learn brand strategy and marketing and all these things because I already did the detour and I did the thing I wasn't supposed to do and I kind of swayed off course. So I came back harder than ever at it and it became one of my dreams to own my own agency. When I, I was working at Urban Influ Influence pri previously, and when I left, I left to start my own agency, but I realized in Seattle, rent prices were crazy. And there were so many amazing design firms here in Seattle that, you know, were closing their shop doors. And it made me really sad, but it didn't crush the dream that I wanted to be able to do my own design agency. So instead, I just made it remote. So instead of an agency, uh, we refer to ourselves as a collective instead. <laughs> and is Ember Crib, that's the first company you started? Mm-hmm. And so talk about the process of like your, your, you got your idea for Ember Creative and the process of like making a reality because most people, new brand new entrepreneurs have this great idea Monday, Tuesday is going to start, right? And mm -hmm. It doesn't work like that, right? Can you talk about how the slow the process is and how much patience you have to have? Absolutely. And when I first started the company, it was supposed to be with a partner. Um, that partnership didn't really work out. And so I realized very quickly I would need to do it on my own. And so I would need to figure out as much as I possibly could about starting a business. And I'm lucky enough, and I have the privilege of being married to my husband, who is very good at that side of things. You know, he is very financially, his brain works in a different way than mine does. But he helped me a lot with figuring out the LLC and figuring out, making sure I have everything ready for taxes. I also started researching and investing in software that would help me to do that. Um, so I use Harvest for all my time tracking and invoicing. I use Teamwork for all of my scheduling and my projects and my to-do lists. So I accessed certain softwares so that it could, it could help me get done what I needed to. 
I also started setting goals for myself in that first year that didn't put too much pressure on myself that I was panicking and having a heart attack every day, but it was enough that I knew, and I had enough experience in design and working at different agencies at that point, I knew a portfolio would be critical. Um, you know, just like with young designers, portfolio is critical because you have to be able to prove you know what you're doing. And in that, the first year, you can't use any work that you've ever done at a different agency as portfolio work for a new agency. I didn't know that. I yeah. Thought, I thought it was your work. Well, so say if all the projects that I worked on at Urban Influence, I couldn't use those for Ember Creative because they were done at another agency and okay. somebody had paid another agency because it, it causes confusion, right? So the only projects you're allowed to use when you start a new agency are things that you've done for freelance. So you've only done them on your own without an agency behind you or backing you. So the point is that you have a full-time job designer, have a side hustle, so to speak, and mm -hmm. go do side projects. Yeah, there's a lot of transition that you have to make. Um, and in that first year, I took on a lot of projects that, you know, at a very low hourly rate so that I could start working with business owners and it almost became, you know, hey, I will give you this very low price, but in return, I get a I get to do the best of my ability and I'm going to make something amazing for you, but I need to have control over it as, you know, as that back and forth. So the first year I really focused on just building that portfolio. So I had a wide range of work and the second year was more focused on diversifying that work. So one of the partners that I have at Ember Creative is Grayscale Design Studio. They are an interior architecture firm located here in Seattle. Their office is up in Fremont. And they do interior design, interior architecture, space planning um, for different companies. So when I first started working with them, I was taking photographs of their finished spaces. I was helping them maintain their website, but it slowly transitioned into more where they can offer brand services for these spaces that they're doing. So it'll be things like directory signage, lobby signage, environmental graphics. And so we will partner together on those types of projects to do env environmental design stuff. Um, I have brand identity projects. I have website design projects. So there are some websites that, you know, I partnered with a developer on and we built those for a very low cost so that we could have some examples of work. So when you're starting out, whether it's after school or you're starting a new company, there's going to be a certain level of either free work or discounted work that you can do to really build that bigger portfolio for yourself. And then you can start saying, well, here's an example of something I can do for you. Here's an example. I've done this in this space. And so you can start to prove the knowledge that you have by showing them projects and case studies. But until then, it was just a lot of building that up for me personally, but less on the business side. So since you started Ember Creative, talk about something that you didn't expect to happen. Like, like when you had your plan, like this came apart. It could be something good, something bad, but something like totally unexpected. Mm -hmm. like, like, where did this come from? Yeah, and that would have to go back to the story of wanting to build it with a partner. You know, I never wanted to start an agency on my own, and I still don't want to be alone. <laughs> Which is why, you know, I'm always engaged in like the Veterans in Residence program. Being able to have people to bounce things off of and talk to and yet advice is so, so valuable. It's, it goes back to that community um, that I learned how to create from being a military spouse and just understanding how important that was. And when I realized it wasn't gonna work with the partner, I just realized I had to figure it out on my own and I was very scared to do that and I did not want to do it, but I was supported and pushed by both the owner of Urban Influence and my husband saying, you can do this, you got this, just go do it, just figure it out. And so I did. So that was very unexpected, but learning the adaptability is important. Um, learning that right out of the gate, I think has served me very well. So two part question, part one, what is your target demographic company? And part two, who is actually buying stuff from Ember Creative? Like, is it actually your target demographic or something, something a to totally different demographic? Yeah, they're two in the same. Um, so right now I usually focus on speaking to business owners and helping them through solving brand challenges for their company, no matter what it is, whether they're relaunching a new product and they need that product designed, or if they are launching a product, they already have the product designed, but they need 
a video or motion graphics and animation to explain this product until they get their first you know, items fabricated. Or if it's a brand new business initiative that they're launching, they don't have a name or a strategy or they don't know who their target audience is, they just have a great idea and they wanna build it and they've either received investment or they've saved up a budget to work with a graphic designer. Um, Cause that's always another challenge too, is a lot of people don't know how much design costs or they've worked with a company like Fiverr, they've gotten a logo off Fiverr and they're like, well, why is this so expensive? I bought a logo for $99, <laughs> which is also a challenge in the industry right now. Um, but I, you know, my target demographic is business owners. And yeah, that's usually who I'm working with outside of those, those partnerships that I make, like with Grayscale Design Studio. Is it ever too early to come to you? Well, you have to know what your budget is. Um, that's an important one. Some people will come to me without a budget and they say, let me know what it's going to be and let's work within that. But if you don't have any idea, that number is probably going to shock you no matter what it is. <laughs> um, especially if you've you've worked with, you know, the Upworks or things like that before. Um, other than that, it's not really too early. You do have to understand certain things about your company. You have to know what your company values are because a good designer will probably ask you that sort of a thing. If you know who your target audience is, if you don't know those things, you can still work with the designer, but you need to work with somebody who understands and knows brand strategy. Even if you want to work with a designer just for design work. If you need it for cheap, work with just a, a regular designer that doesn't do as much of the strategy stuff. If you want that thoughtful design with, you know, your business goals in mind, then work with somebody who understands brand strategy and knows brand strategy, even if you're not doing brand strategy with them, because that thinking will go into the designs they create and you'll, you'll kind of get that bang for your buck included with it. Um, but other than that, it's never really too early to talk to somebody because they can help you formulate your thinking behind what you're offering. So when a company brings you on, like how many hours per week do you spend with that company on average? It just depends on the project and what they're looking okay. for. Um, if they just need a logo or a new brand identity, we put it on a schedule and you know we'll have the full Gantt chart where you have the different sections and what the to-do lists are and when they can expect that to be and what week and where their check-ins are and what meetings we're gonna have. Otherwise, if we work on an hourly basis, right now I'm doing some brand consulting and we're also building a brand um, and we speak at least once a week, if not more. We have really long meetings and there's a lot of involvement, but there's a lot of moving parts to it. So suppose a company comes to you and say, no, we just got funding, money's no object. We have we got to go basic brand stuff. We want you to take everything over. How's that process work? So typically we'll sit down and we'll have a kickoff meeting and we'll go through a lot of questions that are going to give me more insight so that I can do my job properly. Because again, without, without the strategy behind it, it's just pretty and good design is effective, but also beautiful. Um, so we'll sit down, we'll have a kickoff meeting and I'll ask you a lot of questions. So we'll go through one of my favorite exercises called, I call it the five adjectives exercise. Um, they don't necessarily have to be adjectives, but what we don't want is, you know, hey, Jason, give me five adjectives for your company. And you say, well, we make products for HR companies or we, you know, we automate that HR process. Um, we don't want to know those things. I want to know what type of emotions are we trying to communicate? How do we want the audience to feel? What are the values that you're trying to communicate? So if it's, you know, freeing up more time for that person to run their business and not having to worry about the HR elements of their company, if it's going to be, you know, some companies will, they won't know what they are because that can be a very daunting question, but they know what they're not. Almost everybody knows that what they're not. So it could be things like, well, we're not intimidating. We're not forceful. We're not. And then you then can take those and say, okay, so you're approachable, right? Yeah. You're friendly. You're welcoming. Um, so being able to think through some of those, one of my other favorite questions that I actually learned um, through the processes at Urban Influence um, was who, or if you had a spokesperson for your brand, who would that be? Yes. I like that question. That's a good question. Yeah. Because it, it doesn't really matter who you choose. I want to know the reasons, especially if you couldn't give me the five adjectives of what, what your company stands for, what you're trying to communicate or what emotion you're trying to communicate. 
if you give me a person, you can tell me what attributes you think are great about that person. And it probably reflects your company too, or at least what you're aspiring to be and what you're aspiring to communicate. So Mary, what's your vision for your company? That's a tricky question right now. Um, I probably could have told you that a while ago. One of the reasons why I started the MBA program that I did and I made that jump was because of COVID. When everything started, you know, not really falling apart, but shutting down in March, I realized that a lot of my clients might not be able to work with me anymore. And I, again, that adaptability and thinking through the future and what do I do, you know, if my husband doesn't come home or what am I going to do when he's on a year long deployment or all those things that I learned by being a military spouse, I was already thinking ahead. I was like, okay, if I don't get any clients, I need to be doing something else that's going to be beneficial when all of this is over or when this starts to clean, clear up, or if we ever go back to, you know, the new normal that it's going to be. Um, so I started taking these MBA classes. I enrolled in this program. Of course, I stayed as busy as I was before. So, you know, juggling those two things has been quite fun. But because everything shut down and isolated, we have the time to do that now. You know, we're home all the time. We can't really go anywhere. So I, I kind of have the time now. Um, but since I started learning more about business and leadership and communication and all of these other things, it might be kind of exciting to lead a team or you know stretch that in a new way. So I love Ember because it is a flexible system. It's a collection of creatives. It's not an agency per se. I don't think I would ever wanna have an office space unless it is in a beautiful place like a WeWork. Um, but it, it doesn't make sense with the evolving world to have us in one office. So just working on more fun projects, getting more projects for you know, some of the other creatives that I work with. So the videographers, the photographers, motion animation, you know, working with Grayscale Design Studio and coming up with full package branded elements for them on all of those different platforms is really fun. Um, so growth with Ember would be you know, bringing more creatives that that fit all the values and make sense to join the team and have a different skill set that we might not be currently offering and just really work as a team on some really cool stuff. So Mary, back to clients. What's your process or how do you fire a client? Yeah, and we, we actually had this discussion a little bit not too long ago in our, in our Bunker Labs meetings. Um, that can be a challenge. Um, luckily, I've only had to do it a couple of times. And for me, I don't approach it as much of, having to fire them, but looking out for their best interest too. And if I'm not the right fit for what they're looking for, it doesn't serve them to be working with me. So for me, it's less about, you know, firing them because I don't want to work with them and more about letting them go or making a recommendation of another creative that might be better suited to what they're looking to do. So this could be if they have a really low budget, but high expectations. You know, maybe they work with a younger designer, they'll just have to take on more of that art direction and communication and understanding what they need so that they could work with that person. Um, you know, you shouldn't be paying for somebody like me if you don't need all the things that I can provide. You can, you can work with the Upworks. You can work, you have plenty of options. So I fired clients for more of that reason of, you know, it doesn't make sense for your company to be working with me right now. And if it's better for them, then that's the decision I'll make. Okay. And I think it was back in 2019 or 2018, you did a YouTube talk with Adobe Creative. Mm -hmm. Was it 2019 or 2018? Um, it was not this last August, but the one before. So okay. that would be 2019. I don't know. I'm living in a time vortex yeah, now. Was, I don't yeah. even know what year it is. Anymore. Yeah, I don't know what day it is. Like my wife asked me, do you know what day it is? I said, yeah, of course I know what day. What day is it? I said, day that ends with a little Y. Said, <laughs> exactly. What, what do you want to know? <laughs> it's been simultaneously two days and five years since this has begun. So yes. <laughs> So I highly recommend you check out her, her talk on a, it was a holistic branding, correct? Yeah, we did holistic branding for it. So it's two different episodes. It's a two part series. Each episode is two hours long, very similar to the length of this one. And they have a wide variety of videos. So even if you go online and you look at it and I'm assuming we'll probably post a link for it. Yes. Um, they do a wide range of different type of creative talks. 
typically the format is you go in as a creative, you have a project you want to work on and you work on it live on the air. So your screen is being shared. No, no pressure, right? You're talking about design. You're answering questions. There's a live chat that comes in. You do some giveaways. You also have a host there with you. Um, and so I had Terry White, who is an incredible photographer and you know educator, and he works with Adobe a lot. And so I was very lucky to have him next so to my side. So how did you come across the opportunity to do this? I was referred by a friend. Okay. So the developer that we work with, um, his girlfriend had gone on and they recommended me for it. And so then Adobe reached out to me directly and we so set it I up. I guess it was a pretty good experience. Yeah, it was a great experience. Everybody is very welcoming, very kind. You know, you know exactly what's, what you need to be doing going in. You, need, you know what to be prepared for, but it is intimidating. I it's, can imagine. I mean, and it's, it's worldwide. It lives there forever. Yeah. And, and it's it too two hour episodes, right? So 24 mm -hmm. hours, was it all filmed at one time and broke it up or you'd actually took, you took, or you'd over two days? It was two different days, okay. which was great. Um, four hours would have been a really long time to I, be I under that kind of off. pressure. I think, I think you could have it <laughs> off though. The production value was very, very high there. So you get there and there's a giant green I mean, screen behind Adobe, you. Right? It's bright lights. Yeah, it is it, Adobe. Mm -hmm. And then you have somebody on a full soundboard. You have somebody, you know, monitoring visuals of it and, so it can be intimidating. So talk about the importance of having your spouse being supportive of your career. But I think a lot of people don't get the fact, you know, I had this yeah. business and my spouse, a partner, they say they support me, right? But are they really right? Like talk about the importance of that. If you're having your husband, like really being all in and supporting you hundred percent. Absolutely. And you know, it kind of goes back to the military spouse thing too. My husband does support me emotionally. You know, he's always my biggest fan. He's my biggest cheerleader. He's always telling me I can do great things. And that's so very needed. It would be really hard to have a partner that doesn't believe in what you're trying to do. Um, and he is a really good partner when it comes to raising our son as well. He is a hands-on father. He is cleaning dishes and doing bedtimes and that will free me up to be able to do what I need to. Um, but a lot of it is just self-initiated too. And, you know, when he was deployed for eight and a half months or when he was doing special operations and he was gone for a couple months and then back for a month and then gone for a month and then come back for a month, you really just have to figure it out on your own. And whether that's me, you know, writing papers or doing industry research or doing logo designs, in bed next to him while he has his mask and his earphones on and I'm just typing away, but I'm in bed there too. So we're kind of together. Um, there's a lot of that and you know, he doesn't complain about it and he just so continues did you to support me before he was in the, before he was in the military. You met him after he was already in the military. He was in the ROTC program. We met in San Francisco. I went to the Academy of art university for college and he went to the university of San Francisco and I saw a photo of him. And so I found him <laughs> and he was currently at the ROTC program um, at U USF. So he was kind of in the military. He was learning, you know, all the military stuff that they learn in the officer program there, but he wasn't necessarily active duty at that time. Okay. And what else, talk about some of the places y'all have been able to travel to, like what kind of duty stations y'all been to? We've actually only been to a few. When I was still in San Francisco, because I did the whole detour with massage school, I, the Academy of Art graphic design program is also very tense. I think we started out with around 2,300 students and we graduated with 25 of those people. Um, so the program itself, it took me about five and a half years to get my undergraduate degree through them. So it's a very long program. He graduated college prior to me. So he went to San Antonio to attend the, the PA medical program through the army. And I was in San Francisco for those last two years. So we basically met two months later, he left within six months, we were engaged. And then we did long distance that whole period of time. So two years later after meeting him, then I moved to Nashville where he got stationed at Fort Campbell. Okay. So we were there prior to here and now we're here. So let's talk about military spouses. Like I, I think a lot of people don't realize how underemployed and unemployed they are, right? Mm -hmm. I think I, I, numbers are probably wrong. But I think 20, 25 percent of military spouses are, are, are unemployed. Or an example I use a lot of time, like when I was a captain in, in Vicenza, Italy, all the cashiers were military spouses, and they, mm -hmm. they all had master's degrees, right? Yeah. Like, are you kidding me right now? They have master's degrees that like bagging groceries, and they're still underutilized. Like, my, my, like my wife had a master's in criminal justice, never used it, right? Because you're pop, popping around 
Mm-hmm. And then you have like, no companies like, I'm not hiring a military spouse, so I'm leaving two years, right? Versus like, you know, I can really utilize this great talent, right? Mm-hmm. But then there's people like like yourself, Dan Lilly Young, Jess McCarthy, military spouse, no, like, you're like, no, making stuff happen, right? So is it like, is it just the mentality of different people like make stuff happen regardless of the circumstances? Is it, you know, the military, most military spouses are just like the victim mentality, or is it like this? Or is it the military to blame for not setting these people up for success? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it's multifaceted and it is a challenge. And a lot of it depends on how many kids you have too. We only have one son. So the flexibility ends up being much greater than if we had multiple kids. And of course, the cost associated with that too, childcare is insane. And if you get to a certain point where you're paying just as much in childcare as you are to work, it doesn't make sense to be out of the house. Um, and especially for military families, because, you know, the spouse that's in the military, that's, that's the priority, that's the obligation. So then the other partner of that household unit will take care of the kids. Like you mentioned, also the moving around. One of the ways that Josh was very supportive of me as, you know, my military spouse and my husband is that we only moved to locations that we knew I would be successful in my career. He knew the roundabout way I had gotten to my career. He knew how important it was to me. And we only picked locations and we fought to stay at locations or move to specific locations specifically so I could continue to pursue my dreams and my passion of working in graphic design and doing what I could. So it was a little bit of both there. But yeah, if we were you know, overseas or moving around or doing all of those things, it is really hard to maintain a job. So what, what advice do you have for military spouses? Like if there's a brand new military spouse and they're like trying to figure this out, what would you tell them? Mm-hmm. I mean, if building their career or building the pursuits that they have is really important to them, take advantage of deployments. Um, you know, I knew a lot of spouses that it is, it's heartbreaking when your person leaves, especially if it's a long deployment, those year long deployments, you only see them for two weeks. The internet is great. Most of the times you get a FaceTime with them every few days and that's wonderful. And those advancements are awesome, but it still doesn't compare to having your person home. Um, but either way they're gone. So take, take advantage of the opportunity, take advantage of it. And when Josh was gone, I just, I built up my community. Um, we had a babysitter that would do pickups for my son. So she worked at the daycare that he was at. So after work, um, I would go work out. She would take him from daycare, take him home, get dinner in him. And then I would get home about seven. So just in time to do bedtime and do all of that stuff. Um, and then on Wednesdays was my, my night out. So I could actually, she would watch him, I think until like 10 or 11. So I could have dinner with my friends. I could, you know, do some freelance work if I needed to do some freelance work. But most nights after my son went to bed, I was educating myself more. I was working on freelance projects with friends in, you know, adjacent industries like motion and video. And so we would build projects together just to continue to expand my skill set because I didn't have a relationship to maintain. It was it was kind of the good parts of not having a spouse because you have all this additional free time that you can focus on yourself or your personal relationships that you have outside of your spouse and you can put the time in there. And I think it was one of the only reasons that I have learned as much as I have and I've been able to progress in my career in the way that I have because I didn't have a full-time relationship that I also had to put time into. Do you think the military puts pressure on spouses to be a quote unquote a military spouse to spend your time supporting your husband or your wife's military career, mm-hmm. like, like well, social functions, all that kind of stuff versus focusing on your own mm-hmm. career? Mm-hmm. It's kind of a challenge to answer that question for me specifically because I wasn't really the stereotypical army wife. I didn't know a lot about the military. Most of the friends that I made were active soldiers themselves for the most part. And so I didn't see as much of like the dark underbelly of the military as I know many, many women have. And, you know, I've heard from friends that they've had more of those experiences. I was involved in a potluck club, um, you know, to kind of meet some of the other spouses, but that was all that I was really engaged in. I knew the the unit my husband was in, and that was pretty much all I could tell you. But he also has a somewhat civilian job. He's a physician assistant, so he's medical. Um, so it wasn't a lot of military stuff on our end. He'd, we'd talk about medical things or, <laughs> you know, so my experience was very much less 
quote unquote military, then okay. a lot of people's probably would. I, I think been. a big chunk of military spouse too, too is the fact you know that you know if your husband or a spouse retires after twenty years, you've been you know Mrs. You know Army or Navy Air Force first for twenty years, right? Mm -hmm. And you and then you get out like you have like you're like early thirties, you know, late thirties, early forties. And you've done nothing right. Mm -hmm. And then it's going to be really, really hard to like, try to get started right. Yeah. But you also find that in the civilian sector too. You know, you have stay at home moms who stay home with their kids and raise the kids. And then, you know, if something happens with their marriage or their, their kids leave the nest, they've been unemployed for all of that time, which they've been doing so many things. They've been cooking and cleaning and supporting their like, kids like said, and you, educating. You've been the CEO of your family for 20 years. Yeah, absolutely. They have this huge skill set. But on paper, you know, it's you not this there. Big ass gap in like, mm -hmm. what have you been doing all your life? Like, what do you mean what I've been doing all my yeah, life? Yeah, a you, lot. Are you, are you kidding me right now? <laughs> yeah, and so you know, you can kind of find those parallels there. And you know, when we start talking about women in the workplace and you know, pay gaps and things like that, it it just all plays into it. And so, it, some of it's not much of a military versus mil non-military because there are parallel things there and you know things that happen everywhere so change the subject talk about some of your favorite tools that you use as a designer so pretty much the ad whole adobe suite you're a big adobe fan yeah um you know unless you're specifically in ui or ux design you can use things like figma or sketch um, figma is a pretty new tool isn't a pretty new thing yeah i think it was the last couple of years I that i've been using it yeah, I've switched over pretty much to Sketch to build websites because of all the symbols pages that they have. Figma is really great because you can work with multiple people on the same document. I like having the software on my desktop. I guess I'm kind of old fashioned in that way too, but I also haven't had to work in big teams. I've used Figma. I've used it with other designers. We've bounced designs back and forth using Figma, but so far I just use Sketch because I haven't really had a whole reason to switch over. Um, we use Envision app a lot to present websites to clients. It's a great tool for feedback. Um, and for like young designers or designers in general, they have an amazing blog on them too. So it's Envision app, but their blog is called designbetter.co. And they provide a lot of eBooks on design, business thinking for designers, um, how to work better with developers. So we use Envision a lot and they have a lot of great information as well. But other than that, the whole Adobe suite, um, Procreate for illustration work, I'll bounce between Photoshop and Procreate for that. So Mary, talk about the importance of having a personal brand. Like we talked in a pre-talk, you know, mm -hmm. even if you don't think you have a personal brand, you have a personal brand. Even if you post a Twitter post or TikTok, everything is goes to your personal brand. Can you talk about the importance of having that? Yeah, and brand is something that people are starting to become more aware of over the last, you know, especially five years where the social CEO has become a thing Everyone's recently. A company. Absolutely. And you look at the trend of Instagram influencers and it's just this embodiment of personal branding that we never really had to think about before. And now we kind of need to, but it also depends on your business. Is it important for you to have a personal brand or is it irrelevant for you to have a personal brand? Are you going to be the face of the company? Is there an expectation in your industry that you will be a social CEO? Does it benefit you in some way to be a social CEO or have your own personal brand that ties into your company? Do you want to have your own personal brand just to have it? It really is just based on your is goals. This, is it just an ego thing, right? So, I mean, all of it's going to be an ego thing. If, you know, if you're putting yourself in the limelight, there's always going to be a little bit of ego there. But ego is part of what makes humans humans. We all have to have a little bit of ego if you're a business owner or, you know, if you think you're great enough to go out on your own, there's a certain level of confidence and ego that plays into that to even make that decision, I feel like. Can you give some examples of where you've seen companies destroy their brand by doing something stupid or idiotic or mm. just you're like, what, what they even, what were they, why do they even do that right? And how easy yeah. it is to destroy it? What's the what's thing you like, like it takes like years to build up trust or a brand and it takes like a milliseconds to destroy it? Yeah, it depends on the, you know, the company and a lot of the movements that we've been having later when the Me Too movement came, there were a lot of companies that got outed for, you know, CEOs discretions or leadership indiscretions um, where they weren't really treating their people fairly or correctly or right within the company, or they had a personal indiscretion outside of the company. 
the aftermath of that, it all just depends on like the PR and marketing and the way that you handle it. And if you are candid and transparent, and if you can build that authenticity back up, can be a make or break for a company. Because of the internet, I mean, as a CEO, yeah, so your you, personal you, business you, is going to be out there a little you're, bit. You're always, you're always on, right? You know, like. Yeah. yeah, it can be exhausting, but, um, you know, people have to be more aware of that now than they used to, that you didn't used to have to be the face of your company if you were the CEO. Now you do a little bit more. I think everybody's really trying to find that line these days because it is evolving and it's changing and everybody's trying to adapt. And some people don't want to be the face of their company. They just want to run the company. They want to do what they're good at. You might not have that choice much longer. No. So how do you advise someone to improve their personal brand? Well, it all just kind of comes back to goals again. If, um, you know, I have a friend who is, she's a midwife. And so we've been talking about, you know, just individual, you know, activist type things that she wants to take on. So how do you build a personal brand that is also adjacent to your career? And how do you, you know, are you going to be an educational persona? Do you want to educate the public about maybe something that's a little bit less known? Do you, you know, what is your point of wanting to have a personal brand in general? Or what feedback have you been getting that makes you think you need to change your personal brand? Because obviously, most people don't start to think about it until they've had a negative experience or negative feedback in that way that makes you start thinking about, okay, well, how do I solidify my personal brand? And what does that mean? And what does that entail? And the truth is it entails everything. When we talk about brand, whether it's for a person or for a company, it's everything. It's not just a logo. It's not just your website. It's how your customer service team speaks to people when they call in, when they have a problem. How many rings does it take for them to pick it up? Is it an automated system or are they talking to a person straight out of the gate? How many steps do they have to get through to get to a person if they want one? That all ties into your brand too, because if your values are, you know, being approachable, having to go through 20 automated systems is not very approachable and that is not living true to your brand values. So you want to figure out, you know, for a personal brand, what are your values as a person? You know, what are five things? So it goes back to the five adjectives. What are those five things that you feel like you live by and are important to you and you kind of suss out other people to bring into your personal life based on those? For me personally, it's, you know, integrity is really important. We were talking about passion is really important, optimism. Um, so if you encapsulate all of those things, how do you project that into the world? Is it through the way that you dress? Is it the words that you use? Is it the platforms that you're on? Obviously, Instagram or Twitter or Facebook or YouTube or a podcast is going to be different for each person, depending on who you want to be, what you want to do, what do you want to contribute into the world? How are you making the world a better place by being a face of something? Mary, can you have a great personal brand, but a horrible company brand? That's an interesting question. I mean, I suppose it's possible. <laughs> but it depends on what your personal brand is. Um, but typically somebody who thinks about a personal brand and understands those elements will typically just apply that to their company as well, or they learned it by building their company and now they're applying it to themselves. People haven't really thought about personal brands until recently, whereas we've been talking about branding companies for a long time. You know, even co companies that have been around a really long time like Target and Coca-Cola do a really great job of building their brand personality. So we've been familiar with that for a very long time. Personal brand is kind of newer. So I would assume if they, you know, have a great personal brand, it's because they learned it through their company. How does social media play into all this? I mean, you're on all the time. Like you were saying before, it's, you can't entirely hide from it if you want to be in the public eye at all. Um, you know, I have a lot of friends or family members where I'm from in Wyoming that they're not on social media because they don't want to be, but their profession doesn't require that either. Um, you have to figure out which platforms are going to be the most beneficial for you. So obviously YouTube is going to be important for you because we're doing live video and podcast and, you know, Facebook is going to be important. 
but there might be another person who, you know, Twitter is going to be more important for them or LinkedIn. If you're building just your business personality. Do, do you have a, a favorite one yourself? I usually do Instagram a lot for my personal one and for my companies. So Ember creative is on Instagram. I post a lot of, um, you know, portfolio work on there and things that we're working on projects that we've completed. I'll probably be putting more things like this on there. So educational materials. So both designers and business owners can learn more about brand. But Instagram for me is going to be a little bit more targeted toward designers just because it's a visual platform. So there will be a lot of younger designers or other agencies that want to see what kind of work is going on. As far as you know, reaching business owners, LinkedIn is going to be more valuable for me and putting educational materials out in those places, which I am not fully on yet. I'm on LinkedIn as, as a human myself and my, my personal profile is very in-depth and it has a lot of portfolio work on there and all that good stuff, but I need to be better about marketing Ember Creative on there. But it wasn't really a priority until recently for me because I was trying to build up the portfolio. I was trying to network, make connections. I was focused less on new incoming business and more on just doing a really great job of the pieces that I was working on so that I could prove what a good job I can do. So being an entrepreneur is not easy. You know, it's difficult. And, you know, some people say the entrepreneurship is hard regardless. Mm -hmm. Some people will say, like, if you're like a person of color or female, it's even harder What's been your what's been your experience? Has it been harder being a female entrepreneur? Has it, has it been advantages? What's been your take on that? I think it's just been different. Um, my outlook has always been, you know, some things are going to be harder than others, and I just have to adapt and figure out what's going to work for me. Um, I've had the luxury of being able to just naturally be extroverted. So I've always loved talking to people. So networking has always been a little bit easier for me personally. Um, and then just proving that I'm good at what I do and that I know my stuff has been the main part of it. I can't really speak to anybody else's experiences because I've only lived my own. Um, I'm sure I've encountered things that I just kind of bypassed me or, you know, there's been some instances where I've gotten in trouble for, I think it was like talking too much in a meeting or, you know, and so I just kind of stopped talking in meetings. And then I got great feedback after that of, you know, that I was doing so much better. And it was because I literally just stopped talking as much in meetings. So I have encountered a little bit of that, but it's, in my experience personally, it's been somewhat rare unless there's things that are happening that I'm just not paying attention to, which I'm sure there's a little bit too. So I don't know the stats of it, but you no, know, it seems like there's way more like male entrepreneurs than female entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. And like even the veteran residency program, you're like, you're the only female out of eight, eight guys, uh, you know, mm -hmm. eight programs. How do you deal, or how do you deal with the only female in the room? How do you give advice to other, other females who only female, only female in the room? I mean, it's, it just comes down to, you know, know what you're good at and know that your expertise is your expertise and that you have something to offer and you have something to give and you have something people can learn from just as much as anybody else. So, I mean, don't be intimidated by that. Don't put up with any, you know, bull. <laughs> I don't know if I can curse on this. Yeah, I'm going to yeah, try yeah, not yeah. to. No, you can if you want to. I, <laughs> I curse like a sailor at home. So. And then, like, you always see these memes, you know, like, you know, you call a female bossy or, or a bitch, you know, it means like, you know, do, do, do it like, you know, they're really a leader, you yeah. know, or, or they tell mom, us. Mom, mom, entrepreneurs. Yeah. It's like, we have to girl it, girly up every, yeah. every title. And, you know, it's always seemed a little excessive to me, but it gives some people power. You know, there are some women out there that do find power in some of those specific terms for them. I've always just found power in being able to, you know, hold my own with everybody else. And if there is another woman in the room that, you know, they get welcomed into. And if you do get that seat at the table, making sure that other people that might not have that same opportunity as you, that you bring them in, you loop them in, you, you know, support their work too. So it's, it's more just making, you know, that community and. And then, and, and. And for a school system, like I, I, I'm a big, big thing is like, I don't think schools do a good enough job of teaching entrepreneurship, right? Mm -hmm. To everyone across the board, right? Especially females. Like you said before, you know, if you're female, you're bossy or whatever, you, you just thought, you know, like, you know, mom it down, whatever, or stuff like that. How can, how do we teach entrepreneurship across the board at an early age? 
Yeah. And it, it starts with how, how you speak to your kids. I mean, my husband and I have these conversations all the time because we're both in, in getting our master's degree. Um, I'm getting mine in business with an HR concentration because I wanted to learn more about people and people management and how to foster and grow and support teams. My husband's doing his in healthcare. So we have entrepreneur conversations all the time. We have a son, um, but we're having those conversations with him on a constant basis. But we're also having the same amount of conversations about, okay, how do you respect somebody else's body? How do you have consent for your own body? You know, your body is your choice and you have to give me consent before I give you a hug. So even teaching little boys that, you know, the perspective of other people doesn't apply to just other little boys. It applies to little girls too. And so how do you teach some of these principles that starts to break that down where boys are respecting women more and girls more and little girls. And then the little girls are getting more trained, you know, like Daniela does of just teaching them all of those other things like mechanical engineering and, you know, how to voice your opinion and how to stand up for yourself and evangelize for yourself. Yeah, example I use all the time, like, you know, you have two little kids playing, a little boy, the bo little boy, little girl, but playing the mud. Hey, you know, mm -hmm. little Tommy, keep on playing. Hey, little Susie, what are you doing? Go get clean up, put this little dress on, right? Yeah, we teach them gender roles and it, it starts with us. So if we don't necessarily teach them what boys do and what girls do and why that's the standard, then they never really know that. And, you know, it's all kind of a social experiment regardless because we don't really know what the future holds. And I just know I wanted to try to make a little boy that was kinder to women <laughs> and, you know, didn't take their power away from them. We'll see if that was effective. I TBD. I could be totally wrong. <laughs> so Mary, this might be a tough question. Define success for yourself. That is a tough question because everything that I've ever wanted to do so far, I've been able to do. I get to do design for my job. I get to create beautiful, effective things every day. So in that way, I've already succeeded for myself in what I've wanted to do. Um, so now it's just figuring out the next steps. What is going to challenge me next? What do I want to learn next? And that'll, that'll be the new definition of success for me, but I've been having a lot of fun learning more about the business side and struggles that business owners have and, you know, getting to stretch my abilities through things like the veterans and residents program and working with military veterans and being able to see their businesses thrive and succeed as well by being able to help them understand brand a little bit better in marketing. So next, let's talk about something you have, uh, or maybe not a love for, but something you I believe you like, but cannabis. <laughs> yeah. How does cannabis help you in your creative process? And how do you get even started doing this? Like what, what brought you to, have you been doing cannabis a long time, the recent mm -hmm. events or just how does that all work out? No, I'm one of those new age, like soccer mom stoners. Um, so it's only been about a year, year and a half or so okay. since I've been doing the pot. Um, do you do the edibles, the whole nine yards or? Yeah, I do edibles because I, I don't want to damage my lungs and, you know, there's still a lot of studies out there and with just smoke more, and vape in general in your lungs. concentrated, right? It, yeah, it depends where you get and what you get and what you like. Um, I personally prefer, prefer the beverages. So there's a company called Source Technology that I really love. Um, and I do some work with them too. So it's, not really a paid promotion post, but I just really like their products because they're um, using technology, they're pulling out just the THC and the CBD. So you don't have to worry about all the terpenes, you don't have to worry about all the additional stuff that goes into that experience as a cannabis user. Um, people that have been using cannabis for a really long time can talk for you know hours about different terpenes and different things that are in different strains of weed because there's so many different types out there. Uh, for me personally, because I had never been a cannabis user in the past and being a woman, control is a very, a very big thing. I've met a lot of women that, you know, when you go out to a bar, you know that you can have X amount of glasses of wine and still walk to, you know, your Uber or, you know, walk to your house safely because you can still be in control of your own body because there's other things that as women, you kind of have to be aware of so you don't, you know, get hurt or get in trouble or, you know something like that. So being able to be in control and have a specific dosage that I know is going to do the same thing to me as drinking one glass of wine, but in the cannabis version of it. Um, 
for me, I have a lot of anxiety and OCD, which probably plays into me being so organized. For cannabis, for me, it just dampens the OCD and that compulsion enough that I don't second guess myself. I don't have to think twice about what I'm creating. And so I can, you know, have my little cannabis beverage at a low milligram of THC and CBD, but it gives me enough creative freedom that I can write an entire paper or I can design a bunch of logos. And then I wake up the next morning and kind of review the work and, you know, make sure it was still quality work. But some of my favorite pieces and some of the best work I've done and research papers I've done, yeah, have been during cannabis because it just frees me up enough to so be better cannabis, at what I do. Isn't cannabis ever now where you can like you can go to the dispensary and say, I want to feel like this, I want to be energetic, I want to be mm -hmm. mellow. It's like it's like really broken down scientifically now, right? Yeah, you can. Um, I don't have enough education in it. I haven't been doing it long enough to know all of those different things, but that's so why the bud tenders are such mm -hmm. great resources because they either, you know, have been involved in the industry in a really long time, or they've had experience with it, or they've just tried all the different products that they carry. So they understand them a little bit more. So use them as an asset, use them as, you know, somebody you can learn from and find a dispensary that you like that, you know, they're open to that education. And, but again, there's, online resources you can pretty much google anything so you can teach so yourself you said you've want. been doing this like a year two years mm -hmm. what, what made you get started just like just curiosity or like you want to try something new well when i so i'm a part owner in a cannabis company called vena and it's a their vape pens for women specifically and that's what we had talked a lot about when we were researching was the control and what women found valuable if they'd never tried cannabis before in this whole new, you know, there's this whole new market of cannabis users that there wasn't before because of the legalization um, that didn't want to try it before it was legal because they, you know, had job specifics or they didn't want to go to jail because <laughs> yeah. they had kids. Yeah. Um, like in some places in the state still. Mm -hmm. And so I knew if I was going to be in the industry, I had to have a better understanding of why are people scared of it? Why would a woman be afraid to try it? Um, what is, what are those barriers to entry? So some of it could be going into a random dispensary that like they've never been in before and it's not quite their scene. And then asking somebody a bunch of questions when they don't even know what they're looking for. It can be intimidating and challenging. Um, so I just, I knew that I needed to have those experiences so that we could build a product better. And so it was so, pro product research. So it was product research. Product research. <laughs> yeah. And it started with a retreat that I went on um, for women in cannabis. And so, you know, you get the goodie bag and you get all the education and you get to meet all of these amazing women doing incredible things in the cannabis industry, everything from farming to processing to products to, you know, the lab and legal side of it as well. There are women in every part of it. And do you get involved in any of that? I think it's called the cannabis infused cooking. Um, I don't do any of the cooking stuff. I usually stick to a cocktail. One of the other reasons why I started with the cocktail is because my husband wasn't necessarily comfortable with it yeah, when I started I, drinking that's it. That's a good question. Like, how did that conversation go? Like, hey, Josh, uh, just let you know, I'm the military, I'm the military officer, you know, and you're anti drugs, whatever. But just let you know, I'm going to start doing marijuana. Yeah. It, it was an ongoing conversation, engaging comfort level. And one of the reasons why I started with the beverage, because it was something that was familiar to me psychologically. It was something that was familiar to my husband, me having a glass of wine. Um, so again, it was just that low intimidation level. You can have one, you can sip it. You, it feels a lot like having a cocktail or, you know, a glass of wine or something. So for me, it, it was able to just ease it in. I don't think I'll ever be the person that's rolling my own joints. <laughs> um, I have, I can, but you know, that's probably not going to be part of my personal brand. Um, I don't really like the smoke. I don't want it in my lungs. We lead really healthy lifestyles for the most part. Um, but it was a good replacement for wine. And for me personally, I remember just having the I had to look at myself and say, okay, am I drinking wine because I like the taste of the wine or am I having three glasses of wine because I want to get out of my own head? And if there's a healthier way to do that, 
maybe I should be doing that. I mean, cannabis is like pretty healthy, right? Versus drinking and other things, other yeah. you know, things you do, right? I mean, it's difficult because without the federal legalization of it, there's not quite as much research that has been done on long-term effects because of the legality issue. I'm curious to see now with the federal legalization of Canada that happened a few years ago, how many more, you know, medical research studies and all of these other things that are going to be allowed and you can do on a mass scale because now everybody can use it. So you can get larger populations of people that you can get research on and get that data analytics on than before. Um, so who knows, it might change, but just like with anything, you have to live your life and enjoy it and live a good life and enjoy today because I don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. I mean, we're living in a pandemic right now. So yeah. if anything, <laughs> So Mary, so you, you basically tried some new a couple of years ago. Mm -hmm. Talk about the points of trying new things to try to expand her your horizon. Yeah, I, I've always had a growth mindset. Um, after being in school and learning so much about everything, um, things that I was expecting to learn about, like design, but also learning things that I didn't expect to learn. Like I had a mythology class and I learned about you know, the roots of Christianity and the roots of, you know, Greek mythology and Roman mythology and all of these different things. You begin to see the world differently when you learn how to critical think. And so learning new things for me now is it's exciting and I love to learn and I love to use the skills that I have, you know, in brand and design and apply them to different places. So even being able to consult with all the guys in the cohort of, you know, the Bunker Labs VIR program, taking what I know in brand, I'm flexing those muscles in a different way and having more of those meaningful conversations, but I'm still learning something new. I'm learning how to apply it in a different way, but it's always been exciting for me. And the more you learn, the more you know about yourself, the more you know about the world, you can make better decisions for the most part. So back to your son and how you all are parenting him. How do you and your husband go about teaching your son how to critically think? I, I think a lot of parents, like, oh, the school would teach them, you know, mm -hmm. all this kind of stuff. How do you, like, how are you going about teaching your son how to critically think? Yeah, it's every month is different. And every, you know, they grow and they push boundaries. And some things they understand, some things they don't understand. But we've always been big evangelists of not doing things for him. Always walking him through it verbally and making him figure it out. And he's always been very independent, so that's worked really well for him. Every kid is going to have a different personality, and they're going to, you know, either want to be more independent, or they're naturally going to be a little bit more shy, or they're going to be naturally a little bit more invert, inverted, inverted children. <laughs> they're going to be more introverted. Um, so we try to respect him for who he is, instead of trying to necessarily make him into what we want him to be. He's always been very independent, as, as you can tell, and we're doing a podcast and he's sitting in the next room using Procreate, probably Photoshopping cats on rockets or donkeys or things. Um, but when he asks us a question or he asks us how to do something, we don't do it for him. We'll kind of walk him through the steps of how he can figure it out for himself. And then, you know, if it's really something he can't do, then than doing that for him. But a lot of his requests are fueled by, well, why do you think that is something? And so just throwing questions back at him so that he has to kind of do the logic of, okay, well, I know this, so I know this, but maybe that, that, that. Um, but again, it's all just an experiment. I've never been around kids and this is the first one I've had. So yeah, He's like basically you a, you just a guinea pig. You, you don't get a training <laughs> manual if you have a kid, right? You have to figure this shit out for yourself. Yeah, exactly. I mean, what do you do for your kids? You have kids too. Yeah, it's just like I try to make them as independent as possible. You know, like you know, like you said, like not, not do things for them, like make them learn. You know, put them mm -hmm. different situations. I think like give them like the options. Right here's option A, B, C. Like I prefer option A because of this, but you need to learn what you learn. Like right, you know, like you might mm -hmm. I like 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 this option. You might like this type of food. Like what do you want to do? Like what type of person do you want to be? You know, and we'll be the support. You know. Mm -hmm. like, like one thing I like you you tell the time like what makes a successful parent right you oh you're a success if you're, you're a success parent if you're like your your kid's a doctor or lawyer or whatever mm -hmm. and I and I dumb it down like to me like your, your kid is success if they're contributing men of society and you're not success if they're taking away from society right so if they have a, a decent job they're paying taxes you know 
you're successful. Mm -hmm. You might be unsuccessful. They've been in prison or, you know, taken away all the time or or dragged to society. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, you know, for us in our parenting method, a lot of it comes down to how do you make good decisions? Okay. So if we're going to teach him how to make good decisions, we have to teach empathy because he needs to be able to put himself in other people's shoes. He needs to have the critical or strategic thinking side of it. So what are my different options? What's the ramification or consequence of those options? And do I still want to do that thing despite the potential consequence? And you do that thing and you have to to own it. Mm Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so every month we'll have something that we kind of teach. So this month is the varying types of lies. So is it a lie of omission? Is it full deceit? Is it an error? Is it? <laughs> That's the next level right there. Yeah. Well, cause we're just, we're trying to give him the understanding that he might need. He probably doesn't process a lot of it. I mean, he's seven. So I don't know how much of it's sinking in, but we start to see, you know, a few months later, we'll be teaching empathy one month. And it's nothing, nothing, nothing. And then all of a sudden, four months later, he'll say, okay, well, do you think we should be doing that? Because it might make that other person feel such, such, such. So it's sinking in, I think. But again, I have no idea what I'm doing. Yeah. So, <laughs> so back to design real fast. Is it advantage or disadvantage for a designer to be extrovert or introvert? Or does that, that not even matter? It's just different. For extroverts, you have to watch out for having conversations that aren't as meaningful. For introverts, you know, that's a lot of energy that it takes to having those full conversations with people. They need a little bit more recharge time after they have those conversations. Um, So their challenge is going to be, you know, how do I walk into a room and start talking to people I don't know, especially when it draws energy from me. And so their challenge is going to be more about figuring out how to ask open-ended questions, how to facilitate conversations, and what's the goal of the conversation? Are you in the room to network? Are you in the room to meet a new friend? Are you trying to show your expertise? Are you trying to understand more about their business? For an extrovert, it's easy to talk to people, but you really have to rein in, what is the purpose of this conversation? And why are we having it? Because that other person might be an introvert and it might be really exhausting to talk to you. (laughs) And so you have to have that empathy layer there too of, you know, I can't talk to them for too long about random things because this conversation needs to have a purpose. So there's challenges on both sides of it. Let me talk about this a little bit before about like how you bring on designers or creative people. Talk about the type of values and you talk about some, but talk more about the values you want for your company and what like, and here's a good question. Like, there was like a skills, talent versus values, you know, like mm-hmm. if, if a person has the great talent, great skills, the values don't match, like, you know, how do you work through that? Yeah, absolutely. Finding those high performers with those skills, with high values that also, con- you know, match your company can be difficult. I think the first part is what you're talking about is knowing exactly what the values of your company are and what you're looking for in a team member to bring on so that you can make sure that when you're interviewing people, You ask those behavioral questions. You ask the situational questions that get you to the core of your values to see if they're a good fit for them. Because everybody can, you know, say, oh, I have integrity. It's like, okay, well, have you ever had a time where you promised you were going to do something and you didn't deliver on it? And why? So finding out those deeper things. So for me, like we were talking about before, the passion is a big one for me. Um, being able to work with people in art that love art is always fun, just personally for me as well, but it also adds to that intrinsic motivation. Um, being candid, so being able to receive feedback and give feedback without you know, getting crushed internally, which can be really hard for young designers. It was hard for me at the beginning. Luckily, the Academy of Art University does a really good job of like crushing critiques and they they kind of go around the um the line and they make each student say something about your work so you get really used to hearing feedback both good and bad about your work so being able to like take that candor and not internalize it too much and just be able to be good at their job based on that feedback um strategic thinking is huge you should be questioning things if the client wants you to make a logo that's blue you should be asking them why they want that logo to be blue and how it's appropriate for their audience. Sometimes business owners will forget that they're not the target audience for their product. And, you know, there's- Great early lesson. Yeah, their subjectivity plays into it. 
Um, and you have to be able to talk them off that ledge without saying, no, that's dumb. We're not doing that. You have to explain to them why, but they're business owners. They're smart. They've, they speak business, but design can be a whole other language. Um, so be able to have that strategic thinking so that they can facilitate those conversations. But again, that's something that can be learned. It doesn't necessarily have to be something that you come in with, but you have to be open to learning that. So Mary, it seems to me like if you're extroverted, it'd be easy to show you have passion, right? Mm -hmm. How does someone who's introverted show they have passion? Well, part of that's going to be the questions that you ask them during the interview process. And you as a hiring manager or, you know, a founder of your company or whoever is in charge of those, that talent management process, you have to understand how to get those answers out of them, even if they're not extroverted. So making sure that you're not asking them yes or no questions, that you're asking them questions of, you know, tell me about a project that you've worked on recently that got you excited and why did it get you excited? What type of work do you want to work on in the future? What would you do if you have a project that you're not excited about? How would you get yourself kind of in the zone to do that work so that you can feel more of that passion about what you do? So Mary, can you share your social media for both yourself and your company so people can reach out to you? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so on Instagram, it's at Ember Creative. Um, my, my personal one is actually private, <laughs> but um, that's usually just more family stuff anyways. So as far as following, you know, design advice and portfolio pieces and things like that, it's Ember Creative. Um, I'll be posting more on LinkedIn. So if you find me on LinkedIn, my name is Mary Rousey um, because my last name is relatively unique. If you search Mary Rousey, I'm usually the first one that comes up, but we can put a link to it after this as well. Um, and then also Bombini Skin. So we just launched the social media on that. And so if you're interested in skincare, Bombini Skin is the handle there for Instagram as well. And so listen, we have the links to all our social media on the show notes. You can find the show notes at www.cabinetstaysoberlaw.com. And be sure to share this episode. So Mary, who are some designers that you follow? Like, that, you know, like uh, maybe not your mentors, but like the designers you keep track of to see what they're doing. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of it's more agency work than de designers specifically. Um, I always love looking at Pentagram's work because they have so many design partners across the U.S. and so many different office locations. They're always producing really high level work. Um, so I follow them a lot. There's a lot of different freelancers out there too that provide a lot of great advice for designers. So Michael Janda is one of those. He used to own a design firm kind of in the Salt Lake, South Salt Lake City area. Um, but he has transitioned more into, he makes, he writes amazing books. He has one that's called Burn Your Portfolio that is really great for design students. That's one of the ones I always recommend that design students read. It talks about more practical application stuff. Um, he also has freelance pricing for designers because, you know, design, it's hard to put price on things. Um, so he's really great. You can learn a lot from him. Um, I know I'm going to botch her last name, but um, Molly Jackets. She might be French. I don't know. I mean, she, it's, J-A-C-Q-U-E-S. She is a letterer and she does these really beautiful um, letter form designs, but she was a freelancer for a really long time. And so she gives a lot of advice and offers some online classes for hand lettering and building your own freelance business that's really beneficial to designers as well. So now recently, you know, at first I do a lot of startups and before a traditional startup would be like founded by like a, 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 tech, a software developer, maybe a marketing person. But now the latest trend, like having a designer as a founder, right? Mm -hmm. and to me, I think that's a genius, right? Have a founder as a company. What's your, what's your opinion on that? Yeah. I mean, if you have the baseline understanding of what goes into the work that needs to be made, that's always going to be a benefit. Um, and also at the end of the day, I know that I'm never going to let a client down because even if, you know, say I'm one of our designers gets sick or is unable to execute on some of the design work, I can do that work myself. So it makes me feel good and makes me sleep at night knowing that I'm never going to let a client down unless it's a circumstance beyond my control, which I have probably already mentioned to the client that this is going to be a challenge and, you know, upfront and forthcoming with that information because I, I do think candor is very important when it comes to working relationships. So Mary, we talked about this some already, but what, what gives you a drive? Your what makes you so driven, so focused besides, you know, type <laughs> A personality like? Um... You're just, you're just built that way or your environment or just? I think a lot of it's because 
I did make that detour. And so now I have something to prove to myself that I can do this and I can be good at this and I can enjoy it. But I also just love it. I just wake up every day and I get excited to design and I get excited for the new challenge and making something that doesn't exist or finding the right solution for a client through design. I don't know. That part has always just been exciting for me. So Mary, how you do this? You know, you have a lot going on. I ask this question all the time. Like on day to day, are you just winging it? Do you have a schedule? Like, how do you like, you know, like, we all have like 50 things to prioritize. Like how mm -hmm. do you go about doing that on a daily basis? It's changed a lot since COVID has started. Um, I have realized in my life, I am not a morning person. And if I wake up prior to seven, I'm not nearly as effective during the day as I am if I wake up right around seven. So working from home has been a benefit for me, especially during the COVID stuff, because if I had a commute and especially, you know, doing hair and makeup and putting an outfit together on, that's three hours out of my day. So working from home has been a huge asset for me in that way. Um, but I usually wake up around 7 or 7.30 when my husband leaves for clinic and I'm, I'm working by 8. I make a cup of coffee. I make some breakfast. I get working by 8. I also have my son on a separate schedule. So at 10 a.m. he needs to read. 11 a.m. he's doing math stuff. So I kind of have to balance both of our schedules. And then I try to take a little bit of time in the middle of the day to you know, build some Legos with him, have some lunch with him so that he can be more independent because I'm his mom and he wants to play with me. I started teaching him procreate. So sometimes he works on that stuff while I'm working on mine. I usually take another break around 6 PM to make some dinner for the family, um, get him fed, get him in bed. And then after he goes to bed around 8 PM, I'll go sit in bed, probably have my cannabis beverage and continue to work on stuff. So if it's you know, a Wednesday night, I'm probably finishing up discussion posts. If it is a Tuesday night or Monday night, I'm probably doing all of the reading that needs to be done or writing the paper or catching up on some logos for a meeting that I have. Um, I'm way more creative at night. So I try to leverage that time the best I can for writing and designing in the evenings. Mary, you know, some entrepreneurs, they, they're like, oh, I work 100 hours a week, you know, other entrepreneurs like, you know, work 30 days, take a couple of days off. Some people like, you know, they have these different schedules. What do you do personally to take care of yourself? You like work, work, work. You take mm -hmm. all weekends off. Like what's your, what do you usually do? I mean, I have the benefit of absolutely loving what I do. <laughs> so a lot of times, even if I'm not working, I am still working or I'm thinking about something for a client or a project that I'm working on. Um, we do a lot of stuff around the house. So typically if I'm not working on design work or school work, we are like this last weekend, we shoveled dirt. So we're building a retaining wall by hand. So my husband and I laid a concrete foundation. We built up the cylinder blocks. We mortared everything and then we'll skim coat it or we'll, so we're always doing manual labor in the backyard <laughs> when I do have time off. Um, but I don't really have a lot of time to work out. I multipurpose a lot of stuff. I do a full set of squats while I'm brushing my teeth. So that's, that's marching past in a different level right yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, so I'll be, catching up on the news on my phone while brushing my teeth. And then I'll, I'll do my set of squats or I'll do some wall sits or something like that. So, so Mary, we're coming to, come to the end of our talk. Can you give us any advice and wisdom or anything you want to talk about? Yeah. Um, so advice for business owners. Um, I could probably give advice for business owners, for design students and for military spouses. Okay. That'd be great. So for business owners, I would say, you know, really understand your values and what you're trying to communicate before you go to a designer. Um, and work hard to figure those things out and what's right for your company. The more you know about what you're trying to communicate, the better a designer is going to be at their job. So if you already have that leg up, the more, the better. Um, and think about brand as you're developing your processes. So, you know, what is your customer service and how does that pan out and how does that tie to your values and your brand overall? And is it all communicating together? Because it'll make that authenticity, if you're very consistent in your communications, both visually and, you know, your team members, so culturally, culturally in your company. Uh, for young designers, my advice for them is to try to get internships and opportunities to do design before you're out of school. If you're self-taught, use as many opportunities as you can, you know, to do more projects and to get more experience. So even if you become one of the designers on 99designs or Fiverr, that's what those are great for is 
you know, students that are trying to build up a body of work or get more experience working with clients, they can get on those. So the more experience you have, the better, because then your portfolio gets better. Um, the way that you interact with clients are better, and it's going to serve you well in the long run. Um, and for military spouses, it's use all the time that you can when your spouse is gone. All of those extra lulls that you do have, build that community around you. Um, I would have never survived without my community, and especially if you can't afford to pay somebody else. All there will be families that we, you know, have very close relationships with. We do family dinner on Sunday nights. But we also trade our boys. So when I get back later this afternoon, I'll have her son, and then sometimes Dylan will go with them. And so having that community of people you trust without relying on family, because we don't have any family nearby, use that and then use that time to really focus on yourself and build your dreams and what you want out of your life and career too. Mary, thank you for your time today. I really appreciate it. Thank you. It was good being here. And to our listeners, thank you for your time as well. Remember to be great every day.